as you might expect, there is a, a large number of folks watching us all over the world today via live stream. And I want to give a shout out to one group of folks who are watching uh, this service today. It's our uh, senior high students, college students who are on buses right now uh, traveling to Panama City, Florida for the CIY conference uh, down there this week. And they've got their iPads and their iPhones and they're all joining us today, and we just want to say to all you students, we love you. We wish you're here, but we're glad you're online. And would you welcome them as well as everyone else who's watching on live stream today? Thank you. <clears throat> you know, one of the security guys said, you know, sometimes we get on kids for their technology and all that, but in this case, that's a great, great deal that they get to watch uh, this today. Well, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17. I need to tell you right up front that uh, we're in a series of messages on the Jehovah names of God, and I have not changed one word of what I intended to preach uh, prior to the events of this week. So you're hearing a message that was prepared before I left to go out of town on Tuesday to celebrate my 38th wedding anniversary, which, by the way, we had a good time. <laughs> The second thing is, you need to know that all the music this morning was picked out a week ago. Uh, Brian Carter, my associate pastor, says, we're not th that smart. He used to say that all the time. And we're not, but a sovereign God knows exactly what we need. And the music is what we need, and I believe this message is timely for this hour. Uh, you know, in Psalm chapter, 40 verse, or ch Psalm chapter 60, verse 4, the Bible says, you have set up a banner for those who fear you. Let me give you some background to our text before we read it. God had brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He'd led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He'd miraculously parted the Red Sea and uh, told Moses to lift up his staff. And when he did, the waters parted. The Israelites uh, came across on dry land. Then when the Egyptians tried to chase them into that same Red Sea, God told Moses, lift up that staff again. The waters came together, and every Egyptian that followed the Israelites into that Red Sea drowned, and they were killed. Well, they hadn't been long. They were out in the wilderness, and the people began to grumble against Moses and Aaron. They wanted to go back to Egypt for their, the, the old places where they used to stay. They didn't like these temporary tents, and, and they talked about how good the food was back there. They forgot the fact they were in bondage as slaves. And uh, they griped about food, and so God dropped food out of heaven, literally out of heaven. Now, uh, they griped about that bread, and then God made quail all over the ground. So, so now they had bread, and they had meat. They had everything that you think they would need and want, and they still griped and complained. They came to a place called Rephidim, which you will see behind me. That's an actual picture of Rephidim, and there was no water to drink, and so they griped about that. And God told Moses, he said, you take that same staff, and he said, I want you to strike a rock, and water will come out of it. Now, I don't know about you, but I know this much about water. Water may flow over a rock or between some rocks, but water doesn't come out of rocks unless God supernaturally is doing something. And he did. Apparently, having bread fall out of heaven and have quail meat all over the ground and having water come out it's not enough for these people to know that God was supernaturally providing for them. They even had the audacity to say these words. Where's God in all this? They were in a situation and they asked, where's God in all this? And Exodus 17 verse 7 says, And Moses called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They were about to find out that water was the least of their worries. They were about to have a war. And we pick up the narrative in verse 8 of chapter 17. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? The Bible says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. 
So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner or Jehovah Nissi, saying a hand upon the throne of the Lord. And then Moses added, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. You may be seated and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now remember the people have been griping about the food they had and the water God had provided. They'd even question where God was. Is the Lord among us or not? They said. And verse 8 says, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Spiritual principle number one, don't gripe about what God gives you or where he's at. Don't gripe about what God gives you or where he's at. They were griping and complaining and suddenly found themselves facing a war. Have you stopped to consider the fact that the current conflict that we are facing is of our own doing? Verse 8, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. You say, well, who is Amalek? He's the grandson of Esau. Esau was one of the sons of Isaac, a grandson of Abraham. So this is a family war. Their own family members were turning on them. Verse 9, so Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Tony Evans said, and I quote, when Moses said he would go to the top of the hill with the staff of God in his hand, he was referring to a simple shepherd's crook. But this staff was significant because it had been sanctified. This is the same staff that had turned into a snake, ushered in the plagues, opened the Red Sea. Through it, God used the natural to perform the supernatural. And God brought victory to the Israelites in the battle against Amalek as long as Moses continued to hold up the staff. This battle wasn't decided by those who were fighting. The winners and losers weren't determined by their own skill or power. Rather, the key was Moses' posture with the staff of God. Could he keep it raised or would it be lowered? How the armies fared in the valley wasn't tied to their education, finances, or notoriety. Instead, it was inextricably tied to what Moses did on the mountain, end quote. Spiritual principle number two, no one can achieve victory alone. No one. Moses got tired, and he couldn't keep his arms lifted toward heaven. And if the victory was dependent upon him alone, they would have lost. But Aaron and Hur stepped in and stepped up to help. You see, as long as Moses held up the staff, the staff of God, the Israelites would be winning. But when his arms got tired and he lowered the staff, verse 11 says the Israelites would begin to lose. Verse 12, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, you might miss this if I didn't tell you, but did you realize how long Moses held his hands up? Verse 9, again, Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And then verse 12 says, and they held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Moses held his hands up all day long. All day long. With the help of Aaron and her. And I would just say to you here at Crossroads, we need your help holding up our hands. Not not just one day, but every day. Not just one week, but every week. Not just one month, but every month. Not just one year, but every year. We need you to help us hold up our hands. Why? There's a battle going on. And victory is dependent upon us keeping our hands raised toward heaven. We need you to hold up our hands with your prayers, and we need you to hold up our hands with your participation, and we need you to hold up our hands with your giving, with everything you've got. 
We need you to hold up our hands. You see, we can't win without you, and we don't want to win without you. And none of us can win the victory on our own. We need to help each other. We need to hold up one another's hands. Spiritual principle number three, victory comes from the Lord, but that doesn't excuse us from the battle. We have to do all we can in the circumstances and the challenges and the battles and the trials of life, but we also have to realize that unless God is with us, victory will escape us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, the key is working together with him. That's how victory comes. Now, when the Amalekites came against the Israelites, it was an ambush. Remember, here are the Israelites, and they're out in the middle of the wilderness, and everything they have is temporary. There's nothing permanent. Everything's temporary. And they don't have an army. You see, they never had to fight a war before. What were they going to do? You know, some things you can run from, and some things you can hide from, but neither of those strategies were going to work against the Amalekites. Spiritual principle number four, there is no substitute for victory. General Douglas MacArthur was called home from Korea by President Harry Truman. He stood before Congress, and here's what he said, quote, there is no substitute for victory. There is an alternative to victory, defeat, but there is no substitute for victory, end quote. I've often believed if they'd have let Douglas MacArthur stay in Korea, we wouldn't have half the problems we have in the world today, but that's just a personal opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, you're, you're in a fight for your spiritual life, whether you know it or not. Your family is under attack. Your children are under attack. Your marriage is under attack. Your church is under attack. Your world is under attack. And you need to know there is no substitute for victory. Defeat won't be acceptable. You know, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus told us to go along to get along to get the victory. Can't find it. In, in, in fact, I find just the opposite. He told us to, to overcome. He told us to be more than conquerors. Worldly Christians are oxymorons. More moron than oxy, I think, sometimes. So you can't say that in church. I just did. So that'll upset some people. Let them get upset. There's more coming. I mean, actually, a worldly Christian, you, you say it's an oxymoron, and I'm being humorous there, but, 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 but really, they're traitors. A worldly Christian has turned their back on the Lord Jesus Christ. They've turned their back on the Bible. There, there, there really isn't such a thing as a worldly Christian. It's like saying, heavenly devil. James 4, 4, the brother of the Lord said, he said, anyone who becomes a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Worldly Christians. You know what some are calling tolerance and understanding today, the Bible calls sin and compromise. And we're coming to the place now where, where you're going to have to, you're going to have to choose. You know, before you didn't have to, you just kind of sneak in and you, you, you know, you could get your worship on and you could, you could do your little Jesus thing on the weekend and then go live like the devil during the week and, and didn't make any difference. But, but now it's going to make a difference. Some folks been praying, we want to be a church like the book of Acts. Well, now we are. He said, Pastor, what does that mean? You read about the people in the book of Acts. Some of those people paid for their faith with their life. And some of their preachers were beaten and flogged and thrown in jail. We're there. But I tell you what, a church like the book of Acts grew like crazy too, and that's happening here. You should have seen the crowd the first hour, and this hour is packed as well. You should have seen all the people making decisions. You should have seen all the people coming down the aisle the, in the first service saying, we want to be a part of this church. As my friend Dr. O.S. Hawkins says, we're about to find out who, who, whose side people are on. Are they really on God's side or are they not? Are they, are they just playing games? Was Christianity just some kind of a, 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 something they said? Or is it really the, the possession of their heart that they have a personal relationship with Jesus? We're going to find out. Because we're in a war. We're in a battle. We're in a conflict. Friend, listen, you can't have peace with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The only time you have peace with the world, the flesh, and the devil is when you overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. But worldly Christians, they want privileges without responsibilities. They want promises without commandments. They want all the good stuff without any bad stuff. And it doesn't work. They want to know, how far can I go before it's sin? 
before there's a consequence. They want crowns without crosses. They, they want peace without having to pay, pay a price. That's not possible. You can't conquer without a conflict. And there is no substitute for victory with the devil. The Bible says he's a roaring lion and he's a raging liar. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 14, that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? Here's what it means. It means the devil slips in so graciously and quietly that it seems almost unchristian to oppose him. But we must. Because we're on the other side. We're being told by the subtle, satanic, secular humanists to be tolerant. But the spirit of compromise and appeasement and political correctness has poisoned the church. There is no substitute for victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amalek had come out to to war with the Israelites. By the way, this was the first nation they would face in war once they came out of Egypt. They were on their way to the promised land, and now they got to go through a war. Imagine that. You know, some people believe and preach that, that being a Christian means no conflicts, no trials, no difficulties. What Bible are they reading? James says, count it all joy, brothers, when you encounter various trials. Why? Because your faith's going to grow and your maturity's going to develop. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And so Amalek came out, and in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, the Lord said, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Now, friend, I want to tell you something. You don't want to be on God's bad side. I saw a bumper sticker years ago, and it said, God's coming back, and he's mad. You know, some people, they just, you know, they want the baby kissing, you know, hand waving, balloon launching, heavenly father who never gets fired up about anything. Read your Bible. You know, we live in a society where they tell everybody, though, everybody's a winner. Nobody's a loser. Everybody gets an award. It doesn't matter how poor you play the game. Everybody's a winner. That's not true. Friend, I want to tell you something. There's a real heaven and there's a real hell. There are going to be some real winners and there are going to be some real losers. And when there's some folks who step out into eternity and go, I thought there were nine judges. No, there's just one. And he has nail prints in his hands. And he takes pretty seriously people who go against him and defy him and ignore his word and mock him. Be too late then. See, listen, friend, you can live without God if you want to, but you better not die without God because there's too much at stake. That's why we have to reach out with love and grace to people who are trapped in sin. Why? Because they've got a future facing them where it's not going to be all awards and God bless you and you're a winner and everybody gets to go to heaven. No, in fact, this Bible says that the majority of people will go to hell and narrows the way that leads to eternal life. Small is the gate, and few will enter in. Verse 16, Moses added, he said, The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. See, what God was saying to to Amalek was, I'm going to stay after you until I totally annihilate you. Absolute, complete, total victory. I told you there's no substitute for victory. I mean, you don't go to a surgeon, do you? And say, listen, get get 90% of the cancer and just leave 10%. Who does that? God doesn't want us to have anything except absolute, total victory. But you know what's happened in in the evangelical church in America? I can't speak for the whole world, but I can here in America. Some people have gotten to a place where they actually like defeat. I said, well, it's okay. They're content to be conquered. Hey, it's okay, you know. You know, the war's over. The war's not over. The war's just starting. That's not what God wants. God doesn't want us to settle for a single defeat or a single failure. He wants us to to not give up and not quit until we've achieved absolute victory. We serve a God of victory. Spiritual principle number five. If we want victory, we need to rally under the banner of Jesus. Let me be very clear here. There is no victory apart from Jesus. No eternal victory. Oh, you might have a momentary victory. You might have a momentary win here on this temporary place called earth, but there's no ultimate eternal victory under any other banner than the banner of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, Moses lifted his hands toward heaven, and he held the rod of God in his hand. He was literally, visibly demonstrating his dependence on Almighty God, saying we can't do this without God. In verse 16, 
The Bible says Moses built an altar, and he called the place Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. See, that's the problem here in America. We've taken our hands off the throne of, of God. We've told God to stay out of our business, and God said, okay, there you go. You can have it. This is what it looks like. And friend, I want to tell you something. There need to be millions of Christians all over the United States of America who today raise their hands and say, no, not for me. My hand's going back on the throne of God. I will not settle for defeat. We serve a God of absolute victory. Our God, our God is a God of complete victory, of total victory. We have absolute peace because Jesus absolutely defeated the devil at the cross. That was no defeat. The cross is no sign of defeat. That's the ultimate sign of victory. We've heard so much about how loving Jesus is. We, we forgot that he was executed by Rome as an insurrection. Insurrection is considered too dangerous to live. We've forgotten the fact that the organized church of his day called him a, a lunatic and a liar, and they, they wanted him dead. They wanted him gone. But he is Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, the Lord of victory. By the way, Jehovah Nissi issued the challenge of combat back in the, the opening pages of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he said, the seed of woman, Jesus, would crush the head of Satan. I like what John Hagee said. He said, the prince of peace pulverized the prince of the power of the air at the cross on Calvary's hill. Amen. That's how we have peace. At the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He had crushed Satan's head. And friend, listen. The church needs to start acting like victors, not a bunch of whiny victims. We already have victory because of what Jesus did on the cross. We, we do everything we do from a place of victory because of him. So how can, we, how can we do that? Because we're following Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, our victory. We're marching behind the banner of the cross, a sign, a symbol of incredible victory. And listen, we're to be warriors, not wimps. There are too many preachers standing behind pulpits with lace on their pants. And this is a time to stand. This is a time to, to stand for the truth and declare victory in Jesus Christ. You know, Ephesians 6, 12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the average church member in the average church in America says, they stop it, we wrestle not. They don't want to believe there's a real devil. They don't want to believe there's a real war going on. They want to come into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, and then walk out and ignore the God of that grace and ignore the fact there's still a wretch. They say, preacher, that's, that's too hard. Then go find you one of those namby-pamby Casper the friendly ghost churches that won't tell you the truth. <laughs> By the way, I, I apologize to Casper. I kind of like that guy. He's a, he was a friendly ghost. Uh -huh. No, there's all kinds of people who just want to play church. Just want to play at being a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. That doesn't work. I don't know who you're following, but if you're, if you're following Jesus, Jesus said, if they hated me, how much more are they going to hate you? It's like the old spiritual. We used to sing, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Listen, if you don't feel at home right now, that's good. That's good. This is not your home. We've got to do everything we can to bring heaven here on earth. But we need to realize that this earth is not going to be heaven until the old earth has been destroyed by fire. You know, people like to celebrate the rainbow and say, well, you know, God promised he'll never destroy the earth again. That's not what he said. He said he'd never do it again with water. That's all he said. And by the way, you read there in the story of Noah and all that, 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 that men had gotten so wicked and so evil that it grieved his heart that he'd even made man. And by the way, you need to understand that, that God's the one who determines what's right and what's wrong. God's the one that determines what's evil and what's holy. And God's the one that said, I'm tired of it, and you're all out of here. And it was a flood that destroyed everybody. Now, I want to tell you something. Every time you celebrate the rainbow in the sky, and it's a beautiful symbol, it's wonderful. It's, it's sad that it's been co-opted by the LGBT community. You know, it was also co-opted by Jesse Jackson years ago with the Rainbow Coalition. Listen, neither one of those people has the right to the rainbow. That's God's rainbow. 
And God's point is this. All that rainbow means is, I'm not going to destroy, destroy the world again by water. But the Bible does say he's going to destroy with fire. Friend, I don't know if you've tried to swim in fire lately, but you can't do it. They couldn't swim in water either. We're still accountable to a holy, holy God. And we're in a war. Well, Amalek came after God's people. He was the grandson of Esau. Esau hated Jacob. This was Israel's first war. So, so how should they respond? Hold a peace conference? Sign a peace treaty? So well, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back? No, no, no. You know what Moses did? Moses built an altar, and he called it Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, or the Lord our victory. And God promised such a, such a, a, a complete victory that even archaeologists wouldn't be able to find evidence of it. Spiritual principle number six, never settle for half a victory. Our God is a God of absolute victory. I wish I had time today to read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 15. I don't. You'll just have to trust me on this and read it when you get home. 900 years later from the day, God told Saul, king, through Samuel, the prophet, to destroy the, whoever remained of the Amalekites, which would include, but not be limited, to King Agag and all of his cronies and, and all the people who were left. But you, but you know what Saul did? Remember the story? Saul let King Agag live... And he kept some of the spoils of that war. He, what he did, God had said, listen, this is what I want you to do. And Saul said, well, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm just, I'm just going to adjust your plan here a little bit. So God made a little adjustment of his own. He removed Saul as king, took him out. Saul didn't do what God asked him to do. And friend, listen, God doesn't need us adjusting or altering or even affirming His commands. He just needs us to obey them, period. Well, in 1 Samuel 15, 33, Samuel had King Agag brought out, and he cut him to death with the sword. Now, you know what? That doesn't sound like religious tolerance, but it is obedience. We've lived in such a tolerant society so long, we've, we've been duped to believe the go along to get along is the way to overcome evil. But that's not what the name Jehovah Nissi means. It means you press on until you get the victory. It means you don't quit until the job's done. It means you don't settle for second best or almost or, or, or the next best thing. You put your foot on the neck of the enemy and you say, the victory is my God's. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, Isaiah predicted that one day one would come along who would be the banner for the Gentiles. You know who the Gentiles are? It's us. One was going to come along who would be the banner for the Gentiles. Listen to this verse. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples, and the nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. It's talking about Jesus. Now, friend, listen, I've been to the Holy Land. I've, I've walked past his place of rest. And you, you can walk past it, but you can't get past it. He's not there. Friend, the empty tomb ought to be the exclamation point on everything else the Bible says, especially everything Jesus said. You can't get past that. And you better not make light of or make fun of or mock what Jesus says or what anybody in the Bible says because God will hold us accountable for everything we say and do. Jesus said in John 12, 23, if I be lifted up from the earth, just like Moses lifted up the staff of God, he said, I'll draw all men unto me. So we rally around Jesus. He was lifted up as our banner of victory at the cross. And you know what we need to do here at Crossroads? You know what we need to do here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area? God's people need to stand up and declare war on Satan and his hosts. Not on people. Not on people. Our enemy's not people. The LGBT community, they're not our enemy. There are people that we love who've been blinded by our enemy, and they need to be rescued from that life so they can understand what true freedom really is. Just like anybody else involved in any other kind of sin, they think it's freedom, but it's not freedom, it's bondage. And they look at living for Jesus as being bondage, but once they become a Christian, they realize that's freedom. And we need to love them enough to tell them the truth. Psalm 60, verse 4, for those who fear you, you have raised a banner, Jehovah Nissi. We need to rally around Jesus on the cross. 
We need to get a glimpse of Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. Because friends, the times are tough. Our world has turned into a madhouse and the inmates are running the asylum. Society says, get in step with the times. No, sir, we march to the beat of a different drummer. They say, well, you need to be tolerant and you need to accept same-sex marriage and the homosexual lifestyle. No, sir, we don't. The Bible teaches just the opposite. We don't have to accept. We don't have to accept abortion on demand, which has taken the lives of 58 million little children. We don't have to accept removing the words, one nation under God from the Pledge of Allegiance. We don't have to accept removing prayer from schools and removing the Ten Commandments from public places. We don't have to accept removing nativity scenes and any mention of Jesus from public life. No, we need to put on the armor of God and pull out our swords and rally around Jesus and get the victory for Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. Now listen, when David walked out to face the giant Goliath, the Philistine champion, he didn't say, you want to dance? You want to go get a Coke? You read your Bible. You know what he said to Goliath? I come against you in the name of the Almighty God, and I've come to take your head off. And he did. We don't need to be tolerant. We don't need to appease. We don't need to be politically correct. We better be biblically correct. We need to go for the victory every time, all the time. And we need to be more passionate. We need to be persistent. We need to be gracious. Don't be obnoxious. Don't go out and be rude to people. That doesn't get any kind of a hearing. You love people, but tell them the truth. I like what Dr. James Merritt posted on Twitter this morning. He said, better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling people a lie. You say, well, preacher, you're going to become one of the most hated preachers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Bring it on. Bring it on. Listen, because of Jehovah Nissi, who we follow and we rally around, we don't have to quit. We don't have to walk away. We don't have to turn back. That's exactly what the devil wants us to do. But you know what Paul told Timothy, his young son in the faith, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3? He said, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I've said it before, and I'll say it again this morning. We used to sing the song, Onward Christian Soldiers, but we never intended to be in any kind of a war. But now we are. And friend, you better suit up and get your armor on. And you better stand straight. And you better hold up the truth of God's word and say, my hand is on the throne of God. The times are here. The Bible predicted it. And now they're here. And I will just say this. When you understand who God is, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, you will understand there is no substitute for victory. And I will also tell you this, if you'll stand for the Lord, not just here, not just on this campus, not just on one day a week, but if you'll start standing for the Lord everywhere you go, you're going to find victory not only today, but every day. And that's the promise of God's Word. Let's pray. 